now we're going to shift gears. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about the future of retail. Uh, inevitably, when that phrase comes up, people start talking about technology, like what gadget are you going to put into the store? Or, you know, how are you going to like design screens? And I actually think there's a, a much more interesting conversation as well that layers on top of that, which is about how you build and transform physical spaces for the new age of retail. And to discuss this topic, we have three amazing experts, each coming with their own perspectives. Sandrine DeVoe is the managing director of Store of the Future at Farfetch. Richard Found is an architect and designer. And Stuart Miller is the director of investment management at QIC Global Real Estate. So please join me on stage. Welcome. So let's get right into it, because we've got, only got 20 minutes on the clock, and I'd like to cover as much as we can. The, the idea of designing new spaces, you know, the, the idea of designing retail spaces in the digital age, where not, you know, everyone can buy something from here. You know, maybe we'll just go one by one, each of you. Like, what are you, as you thinking about the, this kind of concept of retail in the di physical retail in the digital age. You know, what are your you know, top level thoughts on how we should be thinking about it given all the change uh, in the world? So um, for us, when we, we start thinking about that, uh, it's all about the consumer. And it sounds quite basic, but I think that's sometimes what is actually forgettable. Um, and we think about the consumers in terms of the journeys could be either functional or inspirational. And at which stage of the journey, what customers are going to do and that they will expect back from, from that experience. And that's how then, based on that, we define the technology to follow. And that's really important, I think, because as you said, right, Stop the Future is not about digital screen. It's actually not about tech for tech. It's about that experience to make you come back. So the project we're doing, it's all about thinking about the consumers, what they're going to do, thinking about the fast and the slow journey, thinking about the VIP, thinking about the millenniums. And out of that, how are we going to design those technologies and also ensuring we have the right staff? OK. So uh, for people who aren't aware of Store of the Future and yeah. Farfetch, can you talk a little bit about what it is? Yeah, sure. So Store of the Future is a pretty um, a new division of Farfetch, been created uh, last year. Um, and it's basically a retail innovation harm. So what we do, we develop uh, technologies uh, for brands and for our boutiques. We will actually create that omnichannel experience in the store. Um, so obviously, we are quite lucky because we have like three different pillars, how we describe it, omnichannel, customer-centric, and revolutionary. When we talk about omnichannel, we leverage our, our Farfetch platform, which I'm sure Jose talked a lot about it yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, and the beauty of that platform is proven, so we already added work uh, for our marketplace. Alongside of that, we focus really on that customer-centric approach, back to what I was saying before. So what are really the problem I'm trying to solve? Um, and I think that's kind of what is really important for brands, because a consumer's problem in a retail space could be very muddy. And, and thinking about, OK, today, there is so many different complexity in a retail space. What is that technology going to bring and going to help us to drive? And finally, revolutionary, because that's just the way we work with, um, with different companies, right? right? It's all about tapping into the startup ecosystem and make it uh, a very different proposition to, to our boutiques and to our brand. Okay. So, Richard, um, you actually design, literally, design retail yeah. spaces or transform existing retail spaces into new retail spaces. Sure. You know, when you're thinking about those kind of top-level thoughts around the store of the future, you know, what is it that you, how is it that you approach it? Um, well, I, I've got to be honest, I've had a frustrating two years in that clients come to me and they say, well, we, we want to design a store, we want to do something very exciting, and then we, we've allocated a fantastic budget to technology and um, digital. And we get right up to the point of about to go on site, and they slash the whole budget. 
So they, they talk about being very avant-garde and very kind of on the digital fr uh, forefront, but that, that's the first thing to go. Now, I know that won't be the case next year, no. and it's never the case with you, <laughs> but um, it's, it's quite frustrating because you, th those initial briefing moments, we're discussing doing away with tills, doing away with cash points. Everything is going to be paid on the, on the iPad. And literally, as I say, two weeks before going on site, that's abolished. And then we have to plan, suddenly we have two weeks to plan stores with these ugly cash tills back in the scheme again. So it's a pity that clients don't continue uh, with their initial briefs. If you know. And also, I think what, what's exciting at the moment, talking about the store of the future, is that um, most of my clients say, Richard, I want you to de design a store and remember that that store is only going to be around for five to seven years. And then we're going to rip out that interior and there's going to be a new shop fit. The store of the future, I think, is just going to be a three-year store. I think it's going to be very interesting. I think it's going to be... It, th that store of the future has to be extremely flexible um, internally. And I think it's almost going to be... It's going to feel like a, uh, a, a pop-up, but with integrity. Mm -hmm. And I, what I'm quite excited about is, is obviously, a lot of clients are, do, are moving away from these large flagship stores. No one can afford the kind of Bond Street, Sloan Street kind of rent anymore. And, and those square footage is going to be half the square footage. Um, so I think that it will end up being a, a, a pop-up environment. But I'm hoping that clients are going to understand there needs to be one element that is very, very strong within that store. So it could be that the, where they spend the money could be on this wonderful terrazzo floor that runs throughout the whole store, and then the product sits on that terrazzo floor, and the rest of the environment is where we kind of save a bit of money. Obviously, lighting is very important. Um, but I think what's going to be the challenge is if you have this pop-up environment where it's almost like a stage set, your, your internal VM teams are going to have to be working so hard mm -hmm. because it's suddenly they are like set designers. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and I think it's very important to, to constantly be changing this new pop-up store that you have. So every four weeks or every two months, you've changed something about that store, and it's another reason to return to that store. I mean, obviously, one of the reasons to return to a store is because you're hoping the product has changed that month or in those two months. But another reason could be is that you've given an opportunity to an another brand in the center of the space. It's like... It's, it's, it's just another reason to get back into the store, and I know you may be coming on to that point later, but... Yeah. Um, Stuart, uh, you know, you approach retail, obviously, uh, with an investment perspective, right? So when you, and, and it's interesting, because Richard just says, you know, the store of the future is only three years. So if you're, like, conceiving of new retail spaces and the idea is that, you know, things are going to be changing more quickly, it's quite an interesting thing, but you're, you're creating the spaces in which people put their stores, but you're also doing it with an eye to delivering a return for your investors. Correct. And in an environment, I was um, just thinking before, that such a long lead time and things are moving so quickly that we are literally landing projects now that we were conceiving or yeah. planning before the smartphone. Um, oh, wow. So, um, and so therefore, pulling in what's going on in the world into a very uh, fixed regime is a difficult, um, a difficult challenge. I think you need a, a great dose of naivety, uh, but belief in, in what we're delivering. And lucky for us, our investors have a very long-term view. It's a legacy. Um, real estate, the two, um, they're funny words, I mean, a lot of different things to a lot of different people. I think most people see it as just a rung up from the used car salesman. But <laughs> there's, there's commodity real estate and then there's legacy or longevity real estate. Um, and in that regard, we're just a custodian of that environment. But stitching those experiences together, listening to Richard talk about in-store experience is really what we're doing but in the more macro sense of a built environment a city grid, a city street, but it's about, ultimately, belief in human connection, I think, is really what, what drives that. It's that human connection, I think, that's probably the most unique aspect of retail yeah. now, that, you know, we feel... Um, we feel different when we're in places with other people, right? It's different to buy 
things online and have an interaction with a device than it is to interact with people and be part of an experience. So how, how do you, when you're designing stores around this kind of community-based thinking, like w what kinds of experiences are, are you thinking about? How are you thinking about getting people to interact, not just with the salespeople, but also with each other? I, I think that the, the community idea is so important now. I mean, it's like, if you think about local customers, those customers are coming back to your store, touch wood, 24 times in a year, whereas a tourist will be coming back to your store four or twice a year. So I, I, I love the design of, of the Aesop stores. And I think what's so ex exciting about that concept is that they design a store, they have a different designer, and they design a different store for a different city. But there's certain materials within that store that are found locally. So there's, there's a heritage there. Um, I mean, I'm very pleased that uh, at the end of my street now in London, on a Saturday, I could walk down and there's a farmer's market. Now, those, these farmer's markets are popping up everywhere. And I'm, start, I'm starting to recognize neighbors that I've never met. So this, the, and I, it may be a backlash to massive shopping, um, not shopping centers, uh, supermarkets. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm, I just think it's so important to, yeah. to design with the community, with local community in mind. Yeah, I mean, it is even more important for a shopping center, right? <laughs> you know, growing, growing up in Canada, um, you know, in the suburbs, the shopping center had always been a community place. Yeah. Yeah. Things happened there. There was Santa Claus there at Christmas. There was, you know, there was always activity mm. back then. But I think the need for that kind of community feel when you're thinking about building retail environments yeah. is even more so now. So, so as you conceive of these huge properties that you guys are putting together, like how are you integrating that into the thinking? Well, not thinking them as shopping centres. Yeah. Um, we had that conversation not so long about what, what the future of the mall is, the mall dead. And I, I'm a firm believer the mall isn't dead because we want to come together and congregate. It's the word that it has its use by date. Yeah. Because it's very homogenous. Uh, and shopping centres became very homogenous. Um, so it is aggregating those experiences, what it's about now for us. So it's more than retail, it's more than fashion. It's literally building a place where you want to come and be and connect, whether that be uh, residing there, living there, shopping there, meditating there. It's, it's that, that's the future of the shopping centre in, in, in our yeah. mind. But it's not like we can ignore the impact of technology, right? Because you know, techno you know, people have their devices with them when they shop. They have them with them after they shop, they're taking pictures. So as you, Sandrine, especially you, because I think this is a really core part of the store of the future, is like, you know, give us a, you know, let's, talk, let's look into the future. So, you know, 10 or 15 years from now, you know, what, what do you think that experience is going to be like in order to have a successful physical retail environment that integrates with technology? Well, I think, I'm not sure I can predict 10 to 15 years, but... Okay, for, ho for however <laughs> long you think you no, can. No, but I just think what is really important is really today what all of those... I mean, we are all missing when you think about omnichannel, when you think about technology. We all think about an experience, a great experience online, great website, doing a lot of sales, fantastic. And then we're like, okay, what we want to do in a store? Let's put, you know, a bit of tech everywhere. And, and that just doesn't work. What matters to me is today, if you look at a luxury customer, they interact all the time in their mobile device. They are always, and we are always, on a mobile phone. I mean, and this, this, this little device is pro probably the most personalized device um, we can think of. And yet, I've never seen anyone who has been using that device in the context of the store. And you could be really bold about that, you know? I mean, Richard, you talk about the teal, and for me, the teal drive me crazy, because back to my kind of retail days, like, retailers hate their teal, but when it comes to change it, they can't touch it. They just want to keep it. And you were saying about the fact that actually, when you look at stores, at the end, they still want to have their teal somewhere on the shop yeah. floor. Yeah. And, and so, for me, what really matters is how those stores can really leverage mobile, 
as a way for consumers to probably act and be in control of their shopping experience in the store. What about a store where you can shop everything on your mobile phone, mm -hmm. right? And, and the beauty of that uh, is how you interact with the cell, associ cell associate, which also have mobile devices, devices at their disposal to make your experience so much more interesting. Mm -hmm. and, and from a brand point of view, what matters is that you get what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. You know me. You get the data. Yeah. And I think that's back to what you think about in 10 years, old, in 10 years later. What matters is how a brand can really know who I am and get that connection with me. Yeah, because the risk with the gadgets, I mean, I, I think everyone for a while was looking at what Apple was doing and saying, OK, if we get some salespeople with iPads, that's mm -hmm. the future, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that, you know, maybe some of them didn't re remove their tails or, or did, but I, I just found that you know, the thinking was more about looking like a store of the future, but then actually, what are they doing with the information that they have Absol about these yeah. people? Absolutely, and I think that's a challenge today. I mean, in our stores, what we do, we tend to take your customer detail at the till, if you have the process right, and even if you do it, the data doesn't even go in the right pipes, as I call it. Yeah. So most of the time, the information is wrong. And what we need to think about is the same way we look at a website and how you monitor the clicks, Right? And everyone knows about what I'm doing, uh, for sure on farfetch.com. How can you transpose that in a store, but in a way that the customer doesn't see it? And that's why I think it's really revolutionary what we're trying to do, because that's really the sort of the backbone of, of getting that experience so personalized. So you see, for me, it doesn't matter about technology for technology. It's really how I know that customer so well online, in store. And what I do in store is more about the experience, back to your point, is more about more what you discover through technology, uh, giving uh, an emotional um, contact with that tech, you know, asking them what they think about the next stage of VR. Why not? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's experimental. And, and you value their point of views, but what you know is actually you know everything about them, mm -hmm. and you're able to sell them better. Sure. But, but one of my big concerns is that the, the technology is used for technology's sake. So there are some examples where technology is fantastic within a store. For instance, I went into a sunglasses store in New York a couple of weeks ago, put a pair of sunglasses on, you stare at this interactive mirror, which is great, and then, you've, unbeknown to you, there's a camera on the left-hand side that shows you the side view of the sunglasses on that interactive mirror. Now, to me, that was fantastic. I have an illness when it comes to sunglasses. I can't help myself. Yeah. Um, and, but then I walk down two stalls further down the street, I go into a fitting room trying on some jeans, and suddenly this mirror comes alive next to me. And there's just two questions on this interactive mirror, and it's espresso, cappuccino, question mark. And I'm thinking, that's so bizarre, I don't need that. <laughs> because there is an assistant just the other side of this curtain, yeah. who's a foot away from me, right. and I, who could then say, would you like a coffee? As yeah. opposed to me actually having to yeah. tap onto a screen. It's like... But I just think actually that's a challenge, because I think probably on those two examples, the, those stores haven't thought about the customer journey. Yeah. Haven't thought about, okay, that piece of tech, what exactly the problem you're trying to solve, or what exactly are you trying for the consumer? Yeah. And that's probably why you just thought it's a waste of time. Maybe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so we're almost out of time. I just want to get final thoughts from all of you about, you know, if you are advising brands, you know, we have CEOs in the room, we have designers who are thinking about their own retail operations, like what's the one piece of advice you give them as they think ahead to their, their, their stores of the future. Maybe Stuart, we'll start with you. God, I was hoping I'd get last. Take you by surprise. <laughs> <laughs> he did take me by surprise. Um, uh, I, I, I'll start with Sandrine yeah. and then we'll yeah. come back to you. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so two things. I think, first of all, think about people. Yeah. Okay, think about staff in stores and consumer. Think about how, from a people point of view on your staff, you can really generate uh, their feedback, think about how they're changing. You know, it's sell associate of the future as well. They are not there to sell, they are there to create an experience. So really leverage what they need, what they want, and how they can e enable those experience. Um, people is really important, and how you can create or use them in your product development, in, your, in the technology. Really think about that really hard, because I think it's so hard, it's so easy to get the whole experience wrong, regardless if you have the best technology in your store, that's actually what matters. 
Um, and the second of all, I think what is really important is to try to really embrace what's going on in the market with so many tech out there. So it's important for it maybe in your team or within your organization to have a bit of a team who is actually scouting the market, understanding what this new startup are doing. I mean, we're seeing amazing tech from a guy in a garage uh, who is coming to us with a great piece of technology, but he has no idea how this can change the industry. So I think for me that's really just to think people and have a point of view about what's going on out there, which is not easy, I suppose, okay. but really Richard? key. Richard? Um, two things. I think the store should be totally flexible moving forward. So in other words, you're not wedded to just having X amount of jeans on one wall. You can flex that throughout the whole year. If there's a certain brand that's doing incredibly well, then they can get additional space. I suppose that means that it's almost like a g generic shop fit within a department store. Uh, and I think w we need to make sure there's a reason to come back to that store on a regular basis. Um, what we've done in, the, in uh, Saks downtown is we've got this 200-foot wall next to shoes and we commissioned this graffiti, well, it's not graffiti artist, an artist from London called Barry Rygate who is a bit, he's kind of in between Basquiat and um, Banksy and he's, he's painted this massive mural along all the shoes and what we're going to do every six months is have a new local artist do exactly the same. So that's another reason to, to come say in. it's almost like another store opening, come and see the new mural. Yeah. So, or, or also what we're doing is having these, I, mean, I know it's nothing new, but um, designer dinners. So, you, so your 200 top customers come and have a dinner with, with whoever. It's back to that community thing. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, Stuart. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> um, it, look, it is about a community and, and, and people, and, and I agree with Richard. Um, adaptability being way more nimble but just don't forget your essence or the core of who you are and who your business is um, and you know I just think we need to dial it down a bit and not and, and just not growth for growth's sake yeah you know, it's not all about it's scale not, it's not um, and that 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 really comes to a lot of what we were talking about the last couple of days about the ethics and sustainability yeah I think we just need to own that we're out of time, but thank you very much.